So uh, welcome to Historic Fort Silicon's member lecture series. Before I introduce our speaker, like I always do, I just want to say um, thank you uh, to you for being uh, members. Your membership donation allows the association to preserve and share the first US Army post in the Puget Sound region with our area guests. And so for that support, we always want to be thankful. But we are very excited to be joined by Dr. Lorraine McConaughey today um, as our guest speaker. Um, Lorraine is a public historian who has devoted her professional life to researching and teaching Pacific Northwest history um, in a museum setting. She shared with me that she completed her doctorate in the United States or in United States urban history at the University of Washington in 1993. She joined the staff of Seattle's Museum of History and Industry in 1997 as the museum's public historian and remained at Mohai for more than 20 years. She's an author of many different works. We're going to hear about some of those today. And she has continued to teach at the University of Washington and through Humanities Washington and received many awards, including national recognition from the National Council on Public History, the Oral History Association, and the Association for State and Local History. In Washington, she's been awarded the Robert Gray Medal, which is the highest honor given by the Washington State Historical Society. So we're just eager to hear about the details of her book, Free Boy, Escape from Slavery on the Puget Sound Underground Railroad. And I wanted to mention, Lorraine has suggested that if you have questions during the presentation that you wish to be answered as we're going along, uh, you can put those in the chat and uh, between Walter and I, we'll be monitoring those and can ask Lorraine those questions as we go along. I also wanted to remind everyone just once more that we are recording, um, just so that's said. So with all that said, I'd like to welcome Lorraine to share her screen and the presentation is all yours, Lorraine. Thank you very much. Um, let me see if I can do this. Oh dear. Um, well, I've done it before. Here we go. Have you got it? Yes. Okay, so if I go from the beginning, sorry you guys for all the awkwardness on my part. Okay, is that good? Yes. Yes. Well, thank you all so much for joining me today to have a conversation about this research and this book. Um, it hasn't stopped. The most recent presentation I did on new free boy research was in the fall of 2019. Um, and it was for the National Park Service. They have an annual, well, semi-annual now, um, national conference about the underground railroads of the United States. And I was, it was um, quite fun to present on the Underground Railroad of Puget Sound because it was nearly unheard of. We have a unique and distinctive um, experience to, to research and to talk about today. And um, I'll tell you more as we go along. But as Jim has said, you know, I'm, I'm not looking at chat right now, but he is. So if you have conversation um, or questions, just shoot them to him and uh, he'll, he'll break in as it were and ask me. Life's too short to be bored. So if I'm not clear, you know, let me know. So Free Boy is the title of the biography that Judy Bentley and I published with the University of Washington Press. And it is the intertwined, interactive biography of two very different men. James Tilton, a veteran of the Mexican War, a very distinguished, well-to-do family, the Tiltons in Delaware, uh, a descendant of 
men who had worked in the American colonies and then in the new federal United States after the Constitution. Um, a, a distinguished veteran wounded um, in the Battle of Chapultepec uh, with the war with Mexico, and then a, a, a very strong advocate for the Democratic Party. And we'll be talking throughout the presentation today about what that meant. Um, and it meant something very, very different than it did today. Charles Mitchell was enslaved by James Tilton. Mitchell was far younger. James Tilton was 35 when he was appointed Surveyor General of Washington Territory. Charles Mitchell was born in, 19, in 1847. So he's, what, uh, 20 years younger than James Tilton. Mitchell was born into slavery in Maryland. His mother was a black house slave on the Gibson plantation. His father was a white Chesapeake Bay oyster fisherman. Uh, but slavery inheres in the female line. So being born to a slave mother, Charles Mitchell became a slave himself. So I, I wanted to begin by opposing these two people because their mutual actions have an effect on one another. And as I've, I've worked further on biography, I think I'll be doing two more biographies in my writing and researching career. And I like this kind of idea of a pair, not of opposites necessarily, but of people who interact on one another. And we'll see how Charles Mitchell and James Tilton influenced one another. So we begin here really with the fact that the runaway slave, his departure, his flight is newsworthy in the San Francisco newspapers. It was a newsworthy event and it's worth kind of reading this aloud. It's um, as you see, nearly a month after the event happened, but a mulatto boy belonging to General James Tilton of Olympia was forcibly taken from the steamer Eliza Anderson while lying at the wharf in Victoria, Vancouver Island. It seems the boy had run away from his master and being recognized as a stowaway on board a few hours before the steamer arrived. And that in parentheses is our connection to Fort Stillicum. Being recognized as a stowaway on board a few hours before the steamer arrived was confined in a stateroom to be returned. Some of the parties to his escape, however, gave notice to the authorities, and he was taken from the custody of the captain, Captain Fleming of the Eliza Anderson, on a writ of habeas corpus. We understand that the general did not hold him as a slave, but sought to fit him to make his own living before turning him adrift. Having been relieved of the responsibility by a voluntary action of the boy, he is glad of it, the Port Townsend Northwest. Lots of very important nouns and verbs in this primary source. So a primary source is an uninterpreted source of the time. It is not necessarily true. There may be lies and mistakes in a primary source. We're about to have holiday dinners. Many of you have heard the same family stories at every holiday dinner and every holiday, it changes just a little bit. That's the reality of a primary source, an oral history in that case. But this is a primary source and it is part of our story. Here's another one. This is from the Pioneer and Democrat. This is the Olympia newspaper. And you can see in its, in its title, the democratic persuasion of the politics of this territory. Washington Territory created in 1853 during the presidency of Franklin Pierce, a Democrat. Um, Democrats appointed all of the significant um, offices of a territory, not just Washington, but Idaho and all the others. And they, they appointed the people that they knew who tended to be political operatives. So they gave jobs to their friends. And that meant that Franklin Pierce as a Democrat appointed the first governor of Washington territory, Isaac Ingalls Stevens, another good Democrat who had worked very hard for Pierce's election. So we have this appointment of as many as a dozen Democrats to govern Washington territory, to survey it, 
to uh, be a sheriff in it, to be the governor of it, to um, handle its customs, to do all of the federal obligations in a territory. And they name the newspaper in Olympia, the only newspaper at the time in the whole territory, the Pioneer and Democrat. And this is a quote from that primary source from only three days, four days, from only four days after Charles Mitchell's escape. The people of Victoria, especially the black element and their sympathizers have been greatly exhilarated at the escape of a boy from Olympia who it appears was sworn to by some Negroes as being a slave of James Tilton, surveyor general of the territory. Yeah, I couldn't, I, part of what I'm reading is obscured by, by um, my face. So if I make a misquote, that's why. So again, what I'm sort of building here is the research case where you go back to the primary documents in order to understand history. And the reason this story came about in the first place, the, the free boy biography with, with Judy Bentley, was I was, a, I was working as Jim has said at Mohai in Seattle. And part of my job as the public historian there, when we had a traveling exhibit come, was to root that exhibit topic in the local experience so that mm, the, um, the traveling show didn't land like an asteroid in the middle of the galleries, but made some sense in our lives. So I was sent out to research the civil war in Washington territory because we were about to receive an exhibit from NARA about the Civil War in the United States. Well, I had been taught all through college that there really was no Civil War to discuss, that people came West in order to get away from that kind of antebellum disagreement, that they came here to find gold and coal and to plant orchards. And if you think about that for just a minute or two, you know that isn't true. People bring themselves with themselves. They bring their ideas with them, whether they're looking for coal or gold or not. They carry their ideas like they carry garden seeds, like they carry a Bible, like they carry whatever it is they bring. And they brought those ideas here with them. So as I was researching the exhibit, I thought, well, I will look in the fall of 1860 the most dramatic election in the history of the United States, four main parties running, the northern wing of the Democratic Party, the southern wing of the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and the Union Party. So I opened up the Pioneer and Democrat, this was a long time ago, it was on microfilm, and there was a little tiny headline that said fugitive slave case. And I said, oh, how interesting, that must be about, oh, Covington and Cincinnati and Kentucky or something. But no, it was about this. And this was what I saw on the page. And it, it, it ignited um, a passion in me to learn more about this. So 1853, this is the seal of Washington territory at that time. Um, it, it is uh, not terribly sophisticated art, but it is very interesting in the story that it tells. Al-Key, so often said Al-Kai, but old timers said it Al-Key, in a little while. So it's a Chinook trading jargon word, and you see Lady Hope there with behind her um, the wagon, the, the uh, cabin, the woods, and you see in front of her a sort of, I don't know, Venice um, with a, a side wheel steamer there. Across her dress, she has an anchor. This, this is Lady Hope gesturing toward the future, gesturing from the past, but Alki is, this is the only seal, the only territorial seal in the United States that uses a native word in the seal. And, and it expresses in a way, the, the sort of interactive engagement, sometimes evil, sometimes not, between native people here and the newcomers. And the newcomers came from all over the world. 
they're not just white Americans, as is so often written. If you look at the census of 1860 um, and look at, for instance, um, the soldiers at Fort Stillicum, you will see a very international body of men. And if you look more broadly at the settlement um, census in 1860, and believe me, when you can't sleep, there's nothing more fun than to do this. It's, it's just fascinating. Um, there are a number of people of color in Washington territory, nearly 16, uh, 16 in, in 1860, and many of them are sailors or seamen. They, they, they belong to the sea. The first black man whose story we know well in Metro Seattle was Manuel Lopez, who arrived in Seattle on an, off a whaling ship from Africa. So he was not an African-American, he was a Cape Verdean. Um, so Washington territory is much more complicated racially um, than I think we often think. And Charles Mitchell's story is, is part of that racial complexity. Um, but I think about native people, there is no farther west to go. If you think about the Trail of Tears and think about Oklahoma, think about the movement to the west of one tribe after another, there is not very much to be done here in Washington territory with native people and their labor was valuable as was many of their other attributes. So this is Washington territory in 1860. This is the Washington territory that Charles Mitchell escaped from to Victoria. This is the Washington territory that James Tilton in 1854, he arrived in 1855, was appointed as surveyor of. So you can see that it's Washington as we know it today, all of Idaho and much of Western Wyoming and Montana. It's absolutely enormous, this territory. And when you're looking at that 1860 census, you have to realize how thinly, well, that's not the right way to put it, how few residents there were in the territory. They're not thinly spread though. They're concentrated in urban settings. And then there's this sort of exurban sprawl. And then there's a great deal of not wilderness. I mean, this is not wilderness. People live here. This is native ground, native water, but it's thinly populated. So Olympia, Bremerton, Bellingham, um, uh, Walla Walla, uh, what am I leaving out? Uh, Vancouver. Um, and of course, the army forts, Fort Stillicum, and the more to come. But this is, I just kind of wanted you to have this in your head, how big this territory is. So this is James Tilton. There are a great many photographs of James Tilton. There are lots and lots of documents to study. When Judy Bentley and I did the biography, the twined biography of James Tilton and Charles Mitchell, if you had a balance, uh, the vast preponderance of the evidence was on the Tilton side. We knew more about James Tilton than we wanted to know. I mean, there was so much to learn, not only because his life was filled with event, everyone's life is full of event, but because his life and his family were carefully documented. So you see him here. I'm not, I've never quite been able to make out his left eye. So the eye that's on the right side of your photograph here was injured in the war with Mexico. And because of that, he received a half pay pension um, as, as a veteran. And that becomes important during the civil war because he was obligated to swear to um, fealty, to um, um, a, a patriotic duty to, the United States, what we might call the North um, in, in, the, in, in the, the Civil War. And there was a tremendous argument about that. By then, the Washington Standard is the second major newspaper in Washington territory. And it was a Whig paper that became a Republican paper. And it was opposed to James Tilton's pro-democratic ideas. Well, what, what were they? So most Democrats in the antebellum period were strong expansionists. There was um, a wishful thinking conviction that if the United States could expand what so many people then called the experiment of liberty in an empire, so beyond the Pacific West to Hawaii, 
beyond the, the southern border to Mexico, to Central America, um, in the east to Cuba, really uh, almost any territorial advancement you can imagine, there were those in favor of it. If there could be that infinite expansion of an American empire and the American experiment of liberty, the, the conflict over slavery would diminish. And instead we find that Westering brought the conflict over slavery to the foreground. So James Tilton was a skilled surveyor it was a very valuable set of skills to have um, in the rapidly expanding United States. Um, he was uh, born in, in Delaware, grew up in Indiana. Um, the area that he grew up in is very interesting. Anyway, I won't do a whole lot with that. Just read the book if you're interested. But this is James Tilton, who was known as general um, throughout much of his life, not only because of his service in Mexico, because he didn't become a general there, but because he was appointed surveyor general here, and there was something of a sloppy slop over there, but also because he was in charge of the territorial militia during the treaty war here in the territory of 1855 and six. This is not an image of, of Charles Mitchell, it's a portrait of him by Gregory Christie. There are no images that we were ever able to find of Charles Mitchell. He is an obscure person. Um, his name is not uncommon and neither is James Tilton, but um, Charles Mitchell's name and his race and his age were, were often associated with one another. And only after the book was published were we able to actually be able to tell the story of the end of his life. Um, when we did the book, we were still uncertain. But um, what's important here is that there is no image of Charles Mitchell. And that raises an interesting question for people like you who are interested in museums and interpretations. There are undertold stories because they're underdocumented stories. As a museum historian, I fought the good fight for 20 years to be able to tell undertold stories for which we had no artifact, no photograph, no document, no oral history, no nothing. And all that we had, oh, really uh, was memory. And you could call that oral history, but oral history, you really do want kind of ver verify. And, and there was no way to verify many of the undertold stories. So I just wanted you to see, this is a cover of the book, by the way, a true story of slave and master. You see in the extender, the subtitle here, um, this sort of iterative relationship that we wanted to establish between um, a slave and a master, between Charles Mitchell and James Tilton, because it isn't just one way. Slavery is a mutually corrupting experience. And James Tilton was transformed forever by Charles Mitchell's escape. And, and we'll talk about that later. So we've been hearing a lot about the Supreme Court lately and about the state's rights um, versus federal authority. So I sort of wanted to take a look at the Dred Scott decision, um, a meme that we remember from high school, but that had a tremendous effect on that huge Washington territory that we just saw. So just to refresh, Dred Scott was a slave who um, um, was owned by a US Army doctor who took Scott with him on assignments to a number of forts um, and, and other military establishments on what was called free soil um, throughout the 1850s. And in 1857, a case was brought on his behalf by white attorneys that Scott as a black man had instigated. And the, the Supreme Court ruled in 1857 a ruling that was very important for Washington territory. So this is a time when federal law had tremendous authority in the territory, regardless of what territorial residents thought. So here are three of the many conclusions of this decision. Despite the years that were spent on free soil, Dred Scott was not free. So we start with that. But then it gets more general and gets more interesting for us in this territory. 
Scott had no legal standing as a black man to bring a case before the court. He couldn't even be represented by white attorneys. He was not a full citizen. He didn't have that legitimacy. He didn't have any status to stand before the court. But then the real, the real finding, Scott's claim denied the constitutional right of a man to own property, in this case, a slave, anywhere in the United States. So this is somewhat ambiguous about, say, California. And then later in 1860, Oregon, both became states, both of, of the majority of the settlers there, the residents there, voted to be free soil. But if a man brought a slave with him, that was his property, regardless of whether the soil was free or not. So what this means is that slavery was legal in Washington territory from the time of the Dred Scott decision until the passage of the amendment that ended slavery. And that makes Charles Mitchell a legally held slave that James Tilton brought with him. He was given Mitchell as a wedding gift, James Tilton was, and the promise exacted of him that he would take him all the way from the Atlantic, all the way to Olympia, to Washington territory, and then free him at some future point. So you see here, um, this is not a primary source, it's a secondary source. You see here Washington territory outlined and you see the vertical stripes in it. Um, that keys to the Dred Scott decision. Um, you see uh, the, 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 at the bottom left, um, the Dred Scott decision, 1857, slavery is possible based on that. So you can see the unorganized territory to the west of Minnesota and so forth. So I think this is, this is interesting to remember. These are stories that are easy to forget. I can't tell you um, how few sources really discuss Charles Mitchell. Okay, so we've talked about the Pioneer and Democrat. This is the first um, issue of that newspaper. Um, boy, oh boy, is it, you know, it, it's, it's edited by one guy. It's printed by one guy. Most of the articles are written by one guy and it's all set up in Olympia on type in his office. It is very much a one man band. And this is Olympia in 1856. So it has this sort of deadwood look to it. Um, you can see the street is unpaved. You can see um, the, the remains of a number of trees if, if this were, uh, higher res, there's a couple of stumps that you can see. To the left there, you see that boomtown front. You see the squared off top of the building where the roof behind it is actually sloping. The boomtown front makes it look more like a real building in a proper city. But this is very much a frontier community. And you can see uh, at, at the base of the street there, um, it could be the Eliza Anderson. It could be the international mail steamer. Um, most of the ships, most of the boats coming into the dock at Olympia were sailing, but there are beginning to be more and more steam powered ships from the Hudson's Bay Company, built on the Columbia River, built in San Francisco. But I think it's important to remember um, how sort of mm, primitive Olympia was, the capital of the territory. So this is a chunk of this much vaunted um, 1860 US census here. And this is the Tilton family. And you see um, him up there at the top right, he's the surveyor general, he's male, the, he's 40 years of age. The um, uh, um, uh, dittos in, in the column of ditto, 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 that's white, that's his race. So ditto, 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 his wife, you see the Sheets family. Clara Sheets is a sister-in-law of James Tilton. And then the Tilton children, eight, five, and two. And then Charles Mitchell. And you see under race a B for black. And, and when you're working in the census, you'll sometimes see M for mulatto. You'll sometimes see N for Negro. Um, the census is done by many different enumerators in many different districts. Um, but you also see at the bottom of the page here, James Miller, 
a minister who's boarding with the Tiltons. This is a busy, busy home. But here we have the documentation of a 13 um, year old boy and his age is uncertain. It's given sometimes as 12 and sometimes at 13 at the time of his flight. So again, um, going back to the primary source of the pioneer and Democrat, um, I think I can remember what this says, but my image covers my words here. For the last two or three years, a number of black ingrates about here who have lost not only the respect of uh, the something citizens, which was due to them as, and that is the N word, um, written into the newspaper, but were also despised of people of their own color, have been assiduous in their attentions to Charlie, that's Charles Mitchell, and constant in their endeavors to bring about a rupture between the boy and his benefactors by holding out enticements to him of so flattering a nature as might well be supposed could not be resisted by a boy of his age, including profitable employment becoming a free boy and his degraded condition while a slave, all tended to inflame his mind. So Judy and I did a, um, an education packet, a curriculum packet that's at blackpast.org. Um, and one of the things we ask students to do is to list all of the nouns that were used to describe the Tilton family and all of the nouns that were used to describe Charlie. And you see here, he's described as a slave. He's described as a free boy. He's described as the boy. His owners are described as the benefactors. And you just begin to build this list and write the source, you know, where did this come from? But the, this phrase free boy, this is the, the phrase that we took as the title of our book. And it is um, an emblem or a, a metaphor for the trans transition of Charles Mitchell from Charlie to Charles Mitchell, from this diminution of Charlie, Susie, Becky, you know, I-E, E-Y, Y, to a person, Charles Mitchell. And here, again, from the Pioneer and Democrat, that same fugitive slave case article, but until the arrival of a flashy looking darkie here from Victoria, these arguments were insufficient to wean his affections from his benefactors. He was stowed away by the aforesaid darkie who had been temporarily employed, whoops, as a steward on the Eliza Anderson. And that is James Allen. And that's the most recent research I've been doing. This underground railroad that we're beginning to see form before us here where the Eliza Anderson becomes the, the, the floating bridge, the steam powered bridge across Puget Sound from the slavery in Olympia to the freedom of Victoria, from a white household in Olympia to a black community in Victoria, that is mediated by African Canadian men. And here for the first time, although the name James Allen wasn't in the article, it is he who was employed as a steward, as a cook on board the Eliza Anderson. And it is, it is he who makes the approach here, this flashy looking darky, right? So you have the comment on his clothing, on his style, on his manner. He's not obsequious, he's flashy looking. Again, this is not real, this is um, a, a uh, watercolor by Julie Natariani that we ended up using in the exhibit that I ended up doing for the Museum of History and Industry and then later for the Washington State History Museum uh, to explore the issues of the Civil War in Washington Territory. So he's been tampered with by the worth, worthless free Negroes of Victoria and we know that there were three and we know their names. And one of them, of course, was James Allen. And here you see a secret meeting imagined. We know they happened because he was tampered with. We know that he was convinced. We know it took more than one time. We know, you know, think how hard it would be for him to just say, okay, fine, take me. What's Victoria anyway? I mean, there's no World Wide Web. There's no way to know. Um, what he's letting himself in for. 
and they're saying, do you even realize you are a slave? Do you realize that there is a community of free Blacks in Victoria? We would be eager to accept you into our homes, into our families, send you to school, and set you free. So these are the three men. So this is the most recent stuff I was reporting on to the National Park Service. And um, there's more on these men, but these are their basic, if you were writing a play, um, this describes them reasonably well. So James Allen is the cook, he is the steward. It is he who will take the tremendous risk of having Charlie Mitchell come down to the dock in Olympia at five o'clock in the morning in the dark and whistle. And Alan would hustle him onto the boat, down into the galley and put him into a cupboard, a cupboard big enough to hold a small boy. And these others, um, William Davis is a barber in, in Victoria. I found him in the city directory there. And he was a passenger on that same ship that same day. So he had come down, spent a couple of days in Olympia, probably talking to Charlie, but we don't know that, and then got back on the boat for the ride up to Olympia. William Jerome is another member of this conspiracy, and all three of these men are known to us because they signed their names on affidavits in Victoria, saying that the captain of the Eliza Anderson had Charles Mitchell imprisoned on board the ship. And we'll get to that. This is the Eliza Anderson. So it's a side wheel steamer, as you can see. Um, it, it, would, it plied Washington and um, British Columbia waters for decades and decades and decades. But it gives you a sense, this is not a tiny ship. Um, this, is, this is a substantial ship um, that needed um, a great deal of tending. There is one, um, oh, what would you call it? There's sort of a um, commercial notebook at the University of Washington in special collections from the Eliza Anderson. It's not from the right year for Mitchell's escape, but it does enumerate the crew. And it enumerates um, a, a Chinese man who did the laundry for the, the tables, so the napkins and the tablecloths that the steward, James Allen, would set the table with. So we begin to see the sort of interconnections between the shore and the ship and, and the complexity of race. Now, this is an advertisement. I hope you can see it. I'm not sure if your screen is obscured by my face, but um, it's, it's an advertisement for the Eliza Anderson that appeared in the Pioneer and Democrat. Um, it, uh, it stops at all the ports on Puget Sound, and that includes Stillicum, it inc it, and, and, which essentially it includes Fort Stillicum. But any place anybody hung out, like a tablecloth or something really visible, the, the steamer would stop and pick up passengers, deck and cabin passengers. So in that fairly large ship, there are cabins for people of means. Um, and then there are, there's also sort of a general um, uh, uh, room in which there are seats and tables that one could ride. But this is Victoria in 1860. Now you have Olympia in 1856 in your head very well, but this is Victoria after the Fraser River gold rush has begun. And the forest of masts that you see there is a lot like the forest of masts in San Francisco. This is mostly a sailing society. This is, that's mostly the way people get around. But Victoria is the jumping off place to go up to the Fraser River gold rush. And the population is just surging with, with would-be miners who are coming to Victoria to outfit themselves and figure out whether they're going to go overland or they're going to go by ship um, to get as close as they can to the diggings. But this is the place that Charles Mitchell is being the, 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 the Underground Railroad is being launched from here to encourage him to flee from Olympia and hide away on the Eliza Anderson and come to Victoria. At this time, the population of Victoria is 20% Black. How did that happen? 
This is San Francisco at the same time, a much more robust, a much more urbane place. You see the forest of masts out there in the harbor. Um, this was uh, you know, the major port for the West Coast, for the Pacific West. Um, and uh, we looked at the San Francisco, one of the San Francisco newspapers in our first slide. There's a lot of back and forth between Olympia and San Francisco. I think one of the things I learned that surprised me was how unstatic this society was. I mean, the whole society of the West. It's not like you got to Olympia and you were stuck there. It's not like you got to San Francisco and you were stuck there. But what I want you to see here I want you to imagine here, I guess, is the black community of San Francisco. When California became a state, its residents voted to be a free state. Yet we have this ambiguity in the Dred Scott decision that if a slave owner who had owned his slave legitimately, say in Alabama, came to San Francisco to practice law or something, and he brought his slave with him, then what? So the most celebrated case here, and there's lots written about it, is Archie Lee, A-R-C-H-Y Lee. Archie Lee was a slave. He was brought by his master to San Francisco. And just like Charles Mitchell, uh, Archie was not held as a slave, so to speak, but his labor was hired out. Remember in one of the articles in the Pioneer and Democrat, it said that one of the um, temptations held out to Charles Mitchell was that he could be paid for his work. Well, Archie Lee was hired out by his owner in San Francisco and his owner kept Lee's wages. So that is one case, but where there's one, there's two, where there's two, there's more. It's, it's, it's a not infrequent circumstance, I am quite sure. Also, very well-to-do people of color, Mifflin Gibbs in particular, who wrote an autobiography called Shadow and Light. Mifflin Gibbs and others wished to serve on juries. They wished to vote. They wished to be able to go to the police and say that there had been a break-in at their shop. The police laughed Gibbs out of the police station when he went to report that. He was not permitted to vote. He was not permitted to be on a jury. And this was ubiquitous for people of color. So they got together and they said, we thought we were coming to a free state. All we want to do is work and be respected and make our way. So they sent William Gross, which is a name you may know from Seattle history to Panama to see whether they could move there as a body. And they sent others up to Victoria to see whether they could move there as a body. And they had a very respectable hearing, a very respectful hearing in Victoria, and they undertook to move there as a body. So in 1858, we find this huge out migration of an African-American population from California to Victoria. And it is that that creates that 20% Black population in which this scheme was hatched to create an underground railroad of the West. So these are the resolutions in 1858, or one of them, um, that the Pioneer Committee wrote um, that, that, again, this is a primary source, as they put money into a pot to, to hire ships and to pay the way for people of color in San Francisco. Quote, we are fully convinced that the continued aim of the spirit and policy of our mother country is to oppress, degrade, and outrage us. We have therefore determined to seek an asylum in the land of strangers, Vancouver Island. This is Mifflin Gibbs, and you can see his quote on the right there. Um, again, a, a very well-to-do man. He um, opened a shop in Victoria that competed with the Hudson's Bay Company shop up there. A very determined man. He had been in the Underground Railroad involved in that with Frederick Douglass in Philadelphia before coming to California. Another member, Wellington Moses. Moses settled in Barkerville rather than in Victoria. And again, you see his quote on the right, all you need is money and ability. It's a God sent land for the colored people. And here we have um, the representatives of the black community of Victoria convincing Charlie to hide on shore at dawn on September 24th, 1860 to come on board the Eliza Anderson. 
So the Eliza Anderson leaves uh, Olympia and it steams up the coast and it stops in Seattle. Whoops. It stops in Seattle. And a squad of army men under command of a lieutenant come on board the Eliza Anderson to hunt for deserters from Fort Stilicum. And this is a frequent uh, kind of search. They're, they're very um, competent in finding hidey holes and hiding places and they find Charles Mitchell. They don't find any deserters um, from the US Army but they find Charles Mitchell and they haul him up out of the galley I can only imagine what the cook is thinking. I can only imagine what the other black representative of the Underground Railroad is thinking. They bring him before Captain Fleming. And Fleming says, I know you. I've had dinner in James Tilton's home and I've seen you there. You belong to him. I'm gonna take you back. And for this, we do have um, correspondence back and forth between Fleming and the governor of Washington Territory and the Secretary of State of the United States. Uh, the Washington Territory's governor made a, a big deal out of the escape of Charles Mitchell. So this is the ship that left Seattle. Charles Mitchell has been put to work shoveling coal into the under the boiler that runs the steam engine, that runs the paddle wheel, and the ship eventually gets to Victoria. In Victoria, it is met by a large crowd of Black people and their white humanitarian supporters, as the pioneer and Democrat put it. And the captain refuses to let Charles Mitchell set foot on that dock. Victoria, the British Empire, is free of slavery at this point. And there's the long established principle in the East of underground railroads carrying slaves into Canada to their freedom. This is a duplicate of that. So the captain refuses to let him go. So we have these affidavits filed with the barrister, the attorney, Henry Creese. First, you see William Jerome's affidavit. And again, you know, pay attention to the words, pay attention to the noun, um, to, to just sort of the narrative and the storyline. I, William Jerome of Yates Street, Victoria Cook, I know the boy, Charles. I have resided in Olympia for some time prior to my arrival in the colony. So we're getting something of a backstory for William Jerome. Charles said he was a slave. I'm informed he's at present on the Eliza Anderson and wrongfully detained because he has touched British soil. Has he touched British soil? He's on a boat. And there's some really nice articles, some recent, some very old, on sort of the legal history of this claim. Um, you know, where, where is this ship in terms of international law? Captain Fleming believed that um, British law had absolutely no force on board his ship when he was in Victoria Harbor, end of story. So William Jerome signs here and he signs with an X. He did not sign that name, William Jerome, it was written for him. So we know that it was very unlikely that he could write. He may have been able to read. Oftentimes people could read a bit of their Bible, but they could sign no, they could not write. And here's another affidavit again um, with Henry Creese and here's William Davis, a barber um, and uh, James Allen, he's the cook on board the ship. And they know that Charles Mitchell is locked up on board the Eliza Anderson and the captain and officers will not let him out as they are afraid of his obtaining his freedom by setting foot on British soil. So Henry Creese obtained a writ of habeas corpus using James Allen's, William Jerome's, using the three affidavits in order to do so. And you see here that James Allen, Allen and William Davis were literate and they could sign this affidavit. So the affidavit was filed, the writ of habeas corpus was issued to the sheriff of Victoria. This is a newspaper, the Victoria Colonist, um, these newspapers are fairly easy to research digitally. The Colonist is the hardest. The Washington Standard and the Pioneer and Democrat are very easy. Um, 
And, you know, if, if you want to know how to do that, just write to Jim Lauderdale or Walter Neary and they can send your email to me and I can show you how to do that if you want to do it. So I, again, um, I, I can't entirely see Charles Mitchell is a bright, intelligent lad, I hope, who has received some education. The boy was then welcomed to liberty by his colored friends. It was a righteous decision. What decision is this? Well, when the writ of habeas corpus was served, Charles Mitchell was removed from the boat and the sheriff had to bring um, policemen with him to do this. There was no fight, there was no violence. The captain and the first mate against their will relinquished Charles Mitchell and he put his feet on the dock and he was in British Columbia. He was in Van on Vancouver Island in Victoria. He was taken to jail overnight the next day, he appeared before the magistrate and the magistrate said, well, you know, he's on British soil. There is no slavery here. Charles Mitchell is freed. And that is what this 27th um, of, of September newspaper article in The Colonist announced. So I wanted to end here talking about what happened next. So we know that Charles Mitchell was ab absorbed. He was, he was welcomed into the black community of Victoria. He was sent to school. We, we have records of him at school. It was a very good school. It was a prep school. It was integrated racially. His tuition was paid by the black community. Uh, a hard thing for a researcher is that the African-American community, African-Canadian, excuse me, community in Victoria was so determined to be integrated racially into the community that there were very few things that they did only as people of color. So they went to integrated churches. They sent their kids to integrated schools. They had integrated clubs. So you don't have the kind of mm, specific records, archival records that you would like to have to be able to learn more about what life was like for this child growing up in Victoria. We find him later in San Francisco. Like many people of color, he left Canada after the amendments to the constitution were passed that made slavery illegal and made black men slaves, or pardon me, made black men citizens who could vote. He did come south to San Francisco at the very, very end of the civil war and he joined the US army and we have his military records. So, that, in a way, is saying that's what became of Charles Mitchell. James Tilton is interesting, too, because he was heartsick, not only at Charles Mitchell's flight, but at the Civil War, at the, the failure of any kind of reconciliation to take place. The northern wing of the Democratic Party and the southern wing had separated, each running their own slate of candidates in the 1860 presidential election. Isaac Ingalls Stevens, the first governor, the, the Democratic appointee um, in Washington territory, managed uh, the, the presidential campaign of the Southern Wing of the Democratic Party, John C. Breckinridge. Um, Stevens remained in the United States Army, or he was restored to the United States Army. Breckinridge went south. The governor who was governor of Washington Territory at the time of Charles Mitchell's escape, Richard Dickerson Golson, was appointed by James Buchanan, uh, another expansionist, pro-slavery, pro-states rights Democrat who succeeded Franklin Pierce. Richard Dickerson Golson left the territory to work for the secession of Kentucky. It's very amazing. We have Mayfield in the news right now because of the terrible tornado there. Mayfield was the hub of secessionist sentiment in Kentucky in 1860 and 61. And it is there that Golson spoke for two and a half hours at the Mayfield Convention, urging the secession of Kentucky. It did not happen. So he went to Tennessee, which had seceded. And he was followed by many of the Democratic appointees um, in Washington territory, but not James Tilton. James Tilton stayed. He was fired. Um, by the Lincoln administration as surveyor general, who brought in their own a platoon 
a platoon of political um, toadies, really, um, patronage that, that patronage could advance. Um, so Anson Henry replaced James Tilton as surveyor general. And oh my goodness, they disliked each other intensely. But the interesting thing about Tilton is that he was accused again and again and again in the Washington Standard, the Republican paper has to be factored for bias of being a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle. I would really love to research the, the Fort Silicon records for mention of the Knights of the Golden Circle. They were a paramilitary secret society that was um, partial, that supported the Confederate States of America. In order to join, you had to, to, to donate $40 to the Confederate States of America. You had to sign an oath um, and you had to agree to absolute secrecy. So the Knights of the Golden Circle had chapters throughout Washington territory and elsewhere uh, in the United States, of course. And James Tilton was reputed again and again and again to be a member of the Knights of the Golden Circle. And when he, remember he was getting half pay as a veteran of the Mexican war, when he had to swear that he was loyal to the United States in order to continue to receive that pension, the Washington standard went after him vituperatively, that he was perjuring himself, that he was lying, that everyone knew that he supported the program of the Knights of the Golden Circle. What is that? They drilled in secret by night the only way you could get into that drill was by repeating a kind of dialogue um, that changed like every six months or something. And it was like, I would say, um, if, if I were the guard and you wanted to come in, I would say, what waters the tree of liberty? And you coming in would say, it is the blood of patriots that waters the tree of liberty. And there's this back and forth dialogue that goes on for a while. And then I, I say, yeah, okay, fine, you can come in. What are you doing in there? You are drilling with arms because in order to join the Knights, you had to have a handgun and a long gun and ammunition for each. And you are drilling for a purpose. You're drilling to assassinate the Lincoln appointees in Washington territory. So by then we know Anson Henry is the appointee of surveyor general, but there's new governor too, William Pickering and Pickering was a Republican. So that's what the Knights of the Golden Circle were intending to do. They never did it. it. It was a failed initiative, but the fact that Tilton was associated intimately with them is interesting. And then in 1865, he ran for the only elective office in Washington territory that sent anybody back to Washington, D.C. And that was what was called the delegate, is a non-voting member of the House of Representatives. And Tilton ran as a Democrat against Arthur Denny as a Republican. And Tilton came out fully as an unembarrassed racist in his platform that he wanted to bar Chinese people. He wanted to bar people of color from the vote that the, the contamination of the pioneer society of white settlers was um, all around us. I mean, it's very frank stuff and it's best reported in the Walla Walla Statesman and in an obscure newspaper, mm, the Democrat, it, it, it's a Southwestern Washington territory newspaper. So Tilton loses, he's still a surveyor he goes back east, he works for Washington DC and works in Washington DC. And then he comes west again, working for the Northern Pacific to lay out the city of Tacoma, which was the westernmost terminus of the Northern Pacific Railroad. So that is one walk through the narrative of Charles Mitchell and James Tilton. It's a reminder, I think, that while we think of our territory as so distant, its laws were controlled by the Supreme Court of the United States. Washington territory was governed from Washington DC because these appointees, we, Washington doesn't become a state until 1889. So that long, long childhood and adolescence from 1853 to 1889, it, Washington is governed by the governing party in Washington DC. 
And when you go and look and do your own research in the Pioneer and Democrat or the Washington Standard or any of those territorial newspapers, you'll see more news about Washington DC than Washington territory because the Washington DC news was so crucial to the military, economic and political health of Washington territory. So I don't know if there are any questions. I kind of talked too long, but anybody have a thought? Lorraine, I wanna say thank you very much. Um, I have really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, there's some of this information that I was aware of but I certainly have learned some things today and I really appreciate it. Oh, sure. Um, so thank you. And yes, if anybody, we have not had any questions that have popped up in the chat, but um, if anybody does have a question for Lorraine, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your questions now. Yeah, I do believe people can unmute themselves, but if they can't, uh, say something in the chat and, and I'll unmute you. Lorraine, I'm, I'm curious if, if just ask a question here. The search for deserters on the Eliza Anderson, it, was the thinking that was, do you know, was it a normal pipeline to desert from Fort Stillicum and go to Canada? Because I thought it was more and go to other parts of the United States. What do you, do you know much about that? I don't know much about it. Um, I just know the incidents, you know, sure. that this was not untypical. And I think it's interesting that they they boarded in Seattle, right, rather than any other place with this squad or crew or whatever you, I ought to have called that of soldiers to look for deserters. So I don't know the the route um, for, for from Fort Stillicum. I don't I don't know whether there were army detachments in Seattle itself in 1860 that that you know all i know is what i know and that is all yeah. i know I, I wondered if they were in seattle to patronize any of the businesses there or something like that or could be could be and you know there's a a very good newspaper in seattle by then and and one could research this it's kind of interesting i did want to i forgot to say something that's sort of important the telegraph does not arrive until 1864 right so a year before the end of the civil war and people who were at each other's throats about slavery and expansion and states' rights and the federal right to do X, Y, or Z and the states' rights to do X, Y, or Z, they were united in delight at getting the telegraph. And every newspaper in the territory, whatever they may write during you know, their editorials, they recorded by the day how far north the, the, the telegraph lines had been strung. And it, it dramatically changed the newspapers, as you can imagine. I mean, you're dependent on reprinting news that has arrived overland or um, overland to San Francisco and then up the coast. So stuff is like weeks old. Uh, it took, let me think if I can get this right. I think it took six weeks to learn who had been elected president in the 1860 election. And it took an hour to learn that Lincoln had been shot because by then there was a telegraph. And it, it poor, poor Tilton. The day he announced his candidacy in Olympia out on a balcony, um, his, his speech was interrupted by the arrival of the news on the telegraph that Lincoln had been shot. Wow. Wow. Oh, um, Lorraine, I was going to ask, would you mind if we stop screen share now in case anybody else wants to, you know, come on and, and ask oh, questions? Sure. <clears throat> okay, here we are. I did it. Let's see. Karen, oh, good. There's good friends here. Any other questions for Lorraine, you guys? I mean, I'll ask one more and then we could probably all... Jim and I, we could all talk to Lorraine all day, but I, I am curious. So when you talk about the Washington Standard, that's pretty much John Miller Murphy. I'm surprised that in a small town in Olympia, they're accusing people of planning to kill the governor. I mean, that seems very incendiary. Was that typical of the kind of things people were accusing each other of back then? And there was no, you know, Miller Murphy assumed he could go home safely at night? Yeah, and with Miller Murphy, um, he, let's see, Tilton, let me get it straight. So there's a lot of really cruel back and forth between Tilton and Murphy. Tilton challenges Murphy to a duel 
which is very much, you know, um, I, I did a lot of work on the US Navy at this time. And one of the ships um, in the Pacific Squadron that was off Seattle during the Treaty War, one of the officers on board that ship had fought the last duel at Annapolis, um, then the last duel. So this is very much part of the military thinking of, at the time. This is how you defend your honor. So Tilton challenged Murphy to a duel. And it is really, um, I won't be able to quote it, but Murphy said, no, I don't think so. One of us might get hurt, uh, but let's continue the war of words. Yeah, so, but it, that's a really good point, Walter, because it, it shows that the Civil War wasn't way, way back east. It was very present in people's minds, and they really disagreed about it deeply. Wow. That's a really great point, and, and one that I think that we often forget about in Washington State, that even though we are very far from the seat of war, uh, it, it still was a civil war that, you know, divided a nation. And even within states that remained loyal to the Union, there were factions within those states, copperheads, uh, who supported the, you know, the, the Confederate states' um, ideas and, and their ideals um, of, in regards to states' rights. So that's a really great point, and I'm, I'm glad that you made it. Well, I know more about the Navy um, in 1860-61, that secession winter, than I do the Army, but pick it, right? Yeah. So, right. you know, a, a, a case in point of someone who resigned his commission to go south, and he's oh, not yeah. alone, um, and we know him because Pickett's charge is such a big deal, mm -hmm. but there's dozens of people who are less well known who still had that conviction, and there are others on the other side. There's a fellow who walked from Port Townsend to Indiana, I, I think that's right, in order to enlist in an Indiana unit to fight wow. for the United States. Um, I mean, people, people held deep convictions and, and that's important to remember. It's, it, yeah. It is, uh, Pickett is a great one. Uh, Porter Alexander was also stationed at Fort Stillicum and he resigned his commission to um, go back and, and fight for Virginia um, and, and ended up as, as Robert E. Lee's chief of artillery. And there were a number of others on the, you know, in the Pacific Coast commands that, that all did the same. Do you know much, Jim, about um, regular enlisted men? not officers, but just regular enlisted men who res resigned, quote unquote, to go south? Very few. Um, there, and I say that most of the regular army during that time was made up of a lot of immigrants, uh, whether they be Irish or German, mm -hmm. uh, but the army was made up of a lot of immigrants at that time period. And so there were some uh, enlisted men who you know, may have, I don't know that they could be released from their enlistment, so most likely they would have deserted. Uh, but it was primarily the uh, officers, uh, because many of the officers came, came from the South and you know, returned to the South. Well, some did not. You know, there were some right. officers that were from the South that remained, um, you know, with the Union. In the U.S. Navy and in, in researching the Navy and, and their resignations, um, you know, you get down to pet, below petty officers and there's really no records. Mm -hmm. So they're just deserters, you know, as you say, and you don't know why. And um, I mean, the, sh the ships that I studied were, mm, I think, a higher percentage of Southern officers than in the U.S. Army, but I'm not exactly mm -hmm. sure about that. But um, like 25%, I think, of the Decatur's officers went south in 1860-61. And Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy, mm -hmm. struck them off the rolls as though they had never existed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it was fun to talk about this stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Lorraine. It, it certainly has been. Uh, this is a very enjoyable conversation, and I'm, I'm so uh, thankful that we have the recording that we'll be able to 
um, you know, store in our, our database so that um, you know, in the future, if, if our members are interested in this topic, they can go back and, and watch it again. So thank you for your presentation today. We, we really appreciate it. Does Charlotte have a hand up there? No, I don't think so, but- Or is it Elizabeth? Oh, no, it's just, it's, it's my cursor. Never mind. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay, well, have, have a wonderful, wonderful holiday, and uh, I hope we get some snow. Thank you, Lorraine. You thank as well. Thank you, Lorraine. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah,